everybody, I'm Tom Basso. Welcome to Board Game Breakfast. What a week last week was. Rodney Smith came to join us. We had fun. And that's not the last you'll see of him. We actually recorded another top 10 that you'll see in a couple weeks. This week, Liz is coming to join us. And you're going to see the top 10 solo games uh, coming out later this week. So I'm excited about that. Dice Tower West is only a couple weeks away. And in a few weeks, or next week probably, we'll be opening a registration for Dice Tower Retreat. However, at this point in time, I should mention Dice Tower East. That's not too far away. There's still plenty of time, though, to get tickets and everything for that. So check it out. A fantastic time. The library is so awesome. and It's getting better all the time. As soon as I'm recording this, actually, I'm working on adding more games to it and fixing games and just making them spectacular. So you definitely want to be involved uh, and come to one of our cons. Either way, let's get started with the show. Here we go. Here's something not necessarily that I found on the internet, but that was given to me in person because of something on the internet. And so it talks about my thoughts on Tiny Epic Galaxies, where I say it's a great game, there's no reason for it to be tiny. And so I was given this gift on the cruise, uh, and I had gotten permission from Michael Coe to do this. And as you can see here, this is no longer Tiny Epic Galaxies, but it is Epic Galaxies. So this custom made set here, which has the full rule book in here, nice and big. Comes with these beautiful inlaid boards. <laughs> with, you can actually put the pieces in them. Really cool. You know, you can see how uh, the dice, and look at these dice, silver dice. It's fantastic. Um, so inside here are all these boards. And then I, we can take this out. Underneath that are the cards, which are actually the right size because the cards were the same. And then we have these really well done pieces here, big spaceships, the different pieces, nice big linen finish cards that you can play on. Uh, over here we got the tokens that go in the game. And this keeps the dice. More of the different pieces that are involved in here. And then Ultra Tiny Epic Galaxies was thrown in just because there was space and because they were being cheeky. This is fantastic. It's one of the nicest, coolest, most personalized gifts I've ever seen. And kudos to Game One Games for having the good humor to allowing this to be made and for just for allowing it to be made. It's going to the Dice Tower Library because there's no reason I'm going to uh, keep this to myself. It's a wonderful, fantastic gift. I'm very thankful for it. And um, yeah, that's it. I just wanted to show it off because it's such a neat thing and I'm super thankful for it. Hi, it's Stella. And Tarrant here. We're here because we have a game that we played recently together. It just fulfilled from Kickstarter. It's a wonderful world. Yay! It's a wonderful world. Yep. So, it's a nice quick game. It's a dra it's really a card drafting game, pretty much a pure card drafting game in the Seven Wonders sort of style. And yep. I think it's the nearest thing to that game since that one came out. Yeah, but it's a little bit step up obviously from Seven Wonders. It's a little bit more complex in a way, but it's it's a small step up. It's less icon heavy. It's yep. um it's got more timing to consider. So yep. it's pretty much a pure card draft followed by timed engine. production and it's got an yep. interesting mechanism with the timed production it's also Produ engine building yeah yeah you'll produce each of the goods in sequence and have an opportunity to build buildings with those goods after yep. each production and you can then use the building you've just built to produce on the subsequent productions but not the earlier ones so it does have an interesting timing mechanism and you have to think ahead to where your where your resources that you produce will go and this actually came with the ball, uh, with the game. Um, it's got these sort of little boxes, like it's really, really nice and neat. And it has some sort of a campaign or story-driven. Yep, it has part some it. scenario yeah. content in Ooh. there. So um, yes, they've gone all out with that. It's really good. Um, the yeah, the mechanics are simple. It's really slow to build at the start, but you'll be surprised how quickly it yep. kicks up. And um, it's really all about looking for the cards that give you 
engine scoring multipliers well. at Correct. the end. So there's engine and there's scoring, and it's a really fun little game. We are Maple University on YouTube and how to play videos on the Dice Tower. Bye! Bye. Alright, so here's what we're adding to the library this week. First of all, A War of Whispers. Really like this one. think people will enjoy it. I also got Argent, the Consortium. This is an older worker placement game, but a very good one. And Isle of Cats. This one's so good, we're adding two in to the library. After that, we're also adding in two copies of Ocean. I think people are going to really like this one. And I went over the new expansion for Villainous, so it's probably good if we have everything for villainous in the library. Then we're adding in the Hall of the Mountain King. So looking forward to playing that one. And even though I wasn't a big fan of it, we're going to stick Inner Compass in. We needed another copy of Marvel Champions. And can you believe we need a third copy of the Quacks of Quedlingburg? That's how popular that game is. The only pandemic not in the library was Pandemic Iberia. So I got that as well as a new copy of Point Salad. Parks finally is in the library, yay! And again, another extremely popular one, Empires of the North, we need a third copy of. That's what we added to the library this week. Hi guys, I'm ready. I'm Ellen. We're we game together. Welcome to another call. Yes, baby. <laughs> Eeny, meeny, miny, mo. We're keeping this one. New York Slice. Ellen is iffy on this. I'm iffy. But I think it's great in a lot of situations. It's very quick to play. Very easy to understand and pick up. Plays to six players. It's the I split, you choose mechanic. You are putting out slices of pizza and you are the last one to pick. So you want to make sure that there's at least something left over that you enjoy. I've heard people too say that they don't like the art. They wish it was more cartoony. No, I like no, that it's it real look pizza. Like pizza I think that's it. amazing. I love that. Stuff fables. This one is hanging on by the skin, skin of its teeth. Of its teeth, yes. Mm. Ellen and I do not like this game whatsoever, but our children love it. Although we've only played a handful of times with them because. We don't like it enough to really pull it out. They off never the ask shelf. for it though. When they play it, they're That's having true. a blast, but they never ask in between. It does kind of degrade into they just play with the little plastic figures. <laughs> this one might, might not stay around very much longer. This one, however, will stay around forever. Championship Formula Racing. It is a racing simulator, so it's pretty realistic. It's not like super heavy, but it's definitely realistic. Finally found a group of people that could play this on a somewhat regular basis, maybe every few months or so. So this one is found a permanent home. I love F1 and that I will think I tried it not go away. For five seconds and it felt like math and I was like, I was bad at math, so I don't want to play it. That's true. Um here is this Dice Tower Essentials game viral that we are getting rid of. Yep. Uh, it takes a it takes a little while to explain to people, and because of that, it goes too long. And I think it's the length of it and the fact that it is area control that I just don't like. It but. does area control well. Sure. So I am a little hesitant to get rid of it. No. But explaining it to new people is just kind of a bear. Survive. <laughs> okay. Space attack. So I tried to cling on to this game for him because I thought it was like a fireball island situation where it was something from his childhood that he loved. You it wanted to hold on to it. He found it at Goodwill for like three bucks. And yeah. That's why it's one of the only <laughs> good Goodwill finds I've found. That's uh, true. It's a fun game. It's We do have a five to six player expansion for this also. Mm, I don't know. Yeah. It just feels a little dated. It's a little dated. It is an older yeah. game. Yeah, which is know. fine. There's some old games that are great, but it it felt dated. It didn't just, just feel dated. It felt it. Why keep it then if we have so many other games that scratch the same itch? I agree. Thank you guys for <laughs> joining us again. Hope you enjoyed that one. Did we make any mistakes this time? I sure hope not. But you let us know. Or don't. <laughs> or keep it to yourself. <laughs> <laughs> Bye. We'll see you. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm.
So what's coming up in the Dice Tower this week? Well, I'm taking a look at some big games. Glenmore 2, Terramara, Imperial, and Dominations, a Civilization-style game. And then a bunch of smaller games mixed in there. As I said earlier, Liz is coming in with, to do the top 10 solo games with us. Uh, we are going to be, and she'll be on our board game breakfast too, so that's always fun. Come join that. Uh, me and Roy will be going head-to-head -head a little bit this week. Roy is actually going to be uh, coming in today to do live Q&A, so you can see that. Our podcast will be going up this week. I have Mandy and Suzanne, I think, or yeah, Mandy and Suzanne's podcast is going up tomorrow. And of course, if you haven't seen the Dice Tower Network, lots of cool, fantastic podcasts there. Well, that's a lot of stuff coming on. I'm excited for all of it. Let's keep moving. Hi, my name is Joe Stedman. I'm the original co-founder of the Dice Tower, but you've probably never heard of me because when I was on the Dice Tower, it was just me and Tom and it was tiny. And now it's this global domination thing. We've got a cruise. We've got conventions. Tom Vassell's famous. He's even on TV sometimes. He's got his own Wikipedia page. Back when I knew Tom, I was his only friend. So, wow, a lot has changed. No, seriously, uh, I walked away from the Dice Tower many years ago. I tried to stay involved in the hobby. But, you know, I just got so involved with my career. About 10 years ago, I completely walked. I didn't do anything with gaming. No new games. Everything is new to me. Tom calls me the caveman board gamer because I've been in a cave for all these years and people laugh when I, on the cruise, I just went on a cruise, I play a game that was five years old, I'm super excited, everyone's laughing at me because this is an old game nowadays. Mm -hmm. So, this is board game, uh, board game breakfast, I got two minutes, I thought I'd use this to talk about something I'm excited about, which is trying to find a cooperative game that's actually fun. It's been ten years, I'm hoping there might be a fun one. Because when I was playing board games before, 10 years ago, we only had a few exceptions. For the most part, they're horrible. Forbidden Island, horrible. Pandemic, ugh. I like Battlestar Galactica probably because of the traitor. I like Shadows Over Camelot because my kids liked it. So I just, you know, as a dad, I just kind of, I like the experience playing with my kids. But cooperative games always turn into this quarterback situation where one person's saying you do this you do this you do this and they've got this optimal strategy figured out and it's really one player playing a game solo when we're just there moving their pieces around in my situation my wife is like the alpha gamer so she has the game figured out already and she knows exactly what to do and we just all sit there and move stuff around it just bothers me so much in the last 10 years i've been trying to design my own game that incorporates a cooperative game that's actually fun where every player has a unique strategy that they're trying to do we all contribute together to win the game but no one player can dictate what happens and there's no obvious answers to what everyone needs to do each turn so is there anything like that it's been 10 years you tell me email me look at me up at one of the conventions I'm gonna be at everything you're gonna get sick of seeing me I'm super excited to be back in the hobby I'm looking forward to all the great new friends I'm gonna make and all the games I haven't played awesome thanks Hi, everybody. Hello, we are Ryan and Bethany. From Ryan and Bethany Board Game Reviews. All right, well, today we're going to be talking about Love Letter. But before we do that, we like to talk about what we're doing to try to achieve better health in our lives. And one of the things that I always struggle with is finding the, the time or the, the freedom to go to the gym when we're hanging out with our daughters. Uh, so what we've been taking to doing is we clear out a space in our house, and we just run around, we play tag, we'll come up with challenges, like half on one foot, and just, <laughs> we'll just be really silly for, for a half an hour, and it just burns some calories, it gets everybody kind of tired out before the end of the night. And I I really suggest if you know if you don't have a chance to go to the gym find a find cardio somewhere else there's places that you can uh, work out have some fun uh, and, and be healthier all right uh, enough about that let's talk about love letter all right, so Love Letter, this, is a, this particular version, is a two to six player game. Uh, it's kind of a deduction game. You're trying to figure out what's in other people's hands, trying to eliminate them. So you're either the, either the last person alive or, or not alive, you don't actually kill anybody. <laughs> you're the last person in the hand or, <laughs> or you have the highest card when the deck runs out. All right, so the 2019 version, I really, really, really like the updated artwork. Um, let's just say it's not as awkward to play this version with my daughter. If you've played the 2012 <laughs> version, you probably know what I'm talking about. All right, so when this first came out in 2012, the micro game revolution was in full swing, and this was kind of, in my, as far as I'm concerned, one of the games that put that on the map, that style of game. It was 16 cards, lots of fun, lots of gameplay. And this there's 21 cards, a couple additional cards in here, um, but still, it's extremely travel-friendly. I just love the concept of micro games and just packing a whole bunch of game into a small package. Um, and Love Letter, in, in general, just has so many different additions. 
I personally believe that Love Letter has a space on everybody's game shelf, especially because of all the different versions. You can find your niche. You can find your fandom. It probably has a love letter that you can have. And I just, I think that, um, I'm not saying you need to buy this. I'm just saying that there's space for it. Literally, because it's so small. <laughs> <laughs> um, yeah, this particular version is one of our favorite versions out of the ones we've played. We just always have a great time every time we bust it out. All right. Well, if you'd like to hear our full thoughts on this, go ahead and follow us on YouTube or Facebook. And that is under Ryan and Bethany Board Game Reviews. Well, this is Ryan and I'm Bethany, hoping that you have a hen. And I'm Bethany, hoping that you have a happy, healthy breakfast. Bye, Hi, everybody. Guys. All right, folks, I'm here today with John D'Angelo, who has a game that's on Kickstarter right now, the Rune Lords board game. Now, uh, this we actually did a live play of this. Uh, you can still see the game a little bit set up here. But tell us a little bit, this is your first design? Yes, this is a, f a first time game for Red Gen Productions. And uh, myself and Sean Engel uh, have been working on this game for about three years now, just over three years. Yeah. So, so what made you get into the game design? <clears throat> well, um, I've been a, so my, my background is typically in the entertainment industry being songwriting and, and, um, and cinema and things like that. So, but uh, gaming has always been what kind of kept me rooted. So the first opportunity that I had to really be able to get into the gaming space, I wanted to take the, the best swing that I could, but I also wanted to take a lot of time with it. But gaming has been, since I was, as long as I can remember, gaming has been a part of. Uh, and then when I, my, um, my entertainment attorney actually is the same attorney as the author of this book series. So when I had the opportunity to do a, uh, a game on, the, on, this, on this property, that was another big nudge. Oh, I, yeah, okay. So, so I didn't realize this is actually an IP. It that's is. Out yeah, there? the Rune Lords is uh, eight books in the series, the ninth one coming out soon. And this book series has been around since like, about the mid 90s or so. Yeah. So when you went to that, so you're, you had already read the books? When you made uh, the I had read the first book in high school, so I was really familiar with the title already. So when I had heard the name The Rune Lords, I immediately knew that, you know. I initially was designing this game in Unity as a video game, uh, but it was going to be a digital board game anyway. And then once I had the chance to be able to synergize with an actual IP, then it made sense to just make it tabletop. Well, that's interesting because when you're working with an IP, though, there's like, did you did you go through and like study the books for a while mm, to make yeah. sure you got things right? Um, do you have to run everything by them and go through how that... Yeah, no, so so David's been incredibly supportive of the process since the beginning. The, the game itself takes place years before book one, so there's none of the actual cast of characters in this. We're going to expand into that moving forward. Mm -hmm. So it was an opportunity for him to sort of just see an artist and a designer's interpretation of some of the locations and stuff that he didn't get to really explore too much in the books so it was a it was kind of like a very it was a really open-ended kind of relationship that I had with him for design wise you said this game is a little bit for everybody mm -hmm. can you explain a little bit about that yeah so if you're if if you're into skirmish games that's the the most important thing is that at its heart at its core this is a hundred percent dudes on the map skirmish game right sure. so you have to be into that uh, innately to at the base level but if you don't want if you want to play a faction based kind of skirmish game that allows you the freedom to be able to build the type of army that you want and be able to mitigate RNG through a really cool deck building resource management machine that is really where this game stands, where it shines. It's called the Sovereignty Stage, and that stage is done over 12 rounds of play, and it's done before this game takes place. And you take the pre-generated builds of all the Rune Lords and you mix them together. So when I say that it's a little bit of e for everyone, is because that game is not just a drafting. It's got a full resource management, worker placement, um, uh, deck building. Uh, it's a full in, in itself game. But is that a pre-game or is that a separate game? Like, could you play just that game? Um, you it, you can't play just that game and have a win condition for that game. No, right. You're, all of it is leading you towards combat. But it's allowing you to have the freedom to be able to choose the, the new combos and stuff based off the Rune Lords in a market. With a skirmish game, there are so many out there, right? So it's hard to find something new. Uh, one of the things that you have here is you have the actions, uh, these three action tokens that are on the card. Was that like a in the middle of the night, you woke up with that idea. Oh <laughs> uh, no! So, and um, one of the key factors there is that is that I was doing this as a video game to begin with, with Unity. And when I was designing it as a video game initially, mm -hmm. um, there are a lot of great amazing turn-based, action-based point systems like XCOM, things like that, where they just, they make you choose um, a lot of options, but then they, they zone you down into like, okay, well, doesn't matter how many options you have, you can only do this many of them, right? So um, it was kind of 
comes from a, a video game inspiration, honestly. That's where it kind of rooted from. And our co-designer, Sean, is uh, um, competitively and one of, one of the best video game players that I personally have ever met. So uh, a lot of his in, influence into the game uh, came from the video game side, too. So Action Points is definitely one of them. Is there anything else here that you, like... When you were designing it, you said this is a standout thing that differentiates us, again, from the, the crowded genre. Yes, I, I, I truly believe that our combat system of not being able to miss unless you roll a 1 is a big is a big factor in this game. Most D20s, most games, this this thing can actually just ruin your day. You can have like the best strategic position on the battlefield and then you just roll a three and it feels terrible. Um, so how this game mitigated that is to be able to have that tiering thing where only a one misses, two are better, you always deal basic damage, and then, and then it progressively goes into advanced or critical effects. And I think that really, really, really stands out, especially in the D20 genre, for sure. And the game has a lot of, if your character dies, you just get more characters that yes, come back. Yeah. So it doesn't feel as bad, right? In some some war games, especially Warhammer, of which I I'm a huge huge fan of the lore and of Warhammer in general. But um, I can wait all week, have my army that I've painted, that I invested in, and then I wait until Saturday. I show up at the store, I put my units out on the battlefield, and then something just dies right away, and it feels a, a certain way. In this game something dying is not the end of the world. You have a whole deck full of guys that you're just going to keep continually deploying. Sure. Yeah. Well, if you're looking for this, this can play two to four? Uh, one, one to four. Ooh, we one have, to four. Yes, there's a solo yes. mode, yeah, you said. There is solo, there's solo and, uh, and cooperative gameplay. And then one of the things that we're striving to get to um, with stretch goals on the, on the campaign is to get solo legacy play involved. Um, and that's where every individual rune lord would have a multi-story um, um, storybook legacy campaign that tells their backstory. You meet introducing, uh, introduce unique characters, legendary equipment, um, and then the actual market itself is included into the into the storytelling. So as you're going through the world and you're meeting new characters, they're populating the store with unique items, and uh, and it can really unlock some really great legacy type play. So we're hoping that. But if you if we don't reach that for any reason, we still have adventures. Which are just one to two players can just fight against the map. Really simple setup, win conditions, AI. Well, it's possible that stuff's already been reached as yeah. we, as you're <laughs> watching this. But we'll have a link to the Kickstarter in the description here of Board Game Breakfast. So check it out. Thanks so much for Thank coming you, on. Thank you, man. I really and appreciate it. And I wish it. you great success. Thank you so much. Let's appreciate keep it. moving. Hey, what's up? Welcome back to You Yes, You Can Paint. Today we are taking a look at the topic of painting skin tones, highlighting skin tones, I should say. We're going to be highlighting up the skin tones that we put on that Jason Todd figure a couple days ago. Let's take a look at what that looks like right now. So when we're starting with Caucasian skin, we're going to be highlighting up from our darker shade, that Cadian Flesh Tone color. What we're going to do is we're going to take that base color that we used before of Cadian Flesh Tone, and then we're going to mix it uh, lighter and lighter with some Kislev Flesh and even some uh, white in there until we get these cheekbones and the chin and the nose and then a little bit of the forehead highlighted very bright, and then some of the fingertips as well. It's just going to add depth and realism to these skin tones. Again, we're looking for that skim milk consistency. So yet again, try to get that right across there. We're gonna try to get those things like the chin and those cheekbones right around the chin line and then right on the forehead, depending on kind of how you want light to hit, maybe not all of it. And then right there on the tip of the nose, we wanna make sure we highlight that up. So it's really, really simple, really small steps. We're gonna just repeat this over and over until we get the color exactly where we want it to be. Same thing with the fingers. Go in there and highlight each fingertip and eventually we'll highlight just the knuckles to make the brightest highlights. As soon as it dries, you can go back over it again until it starts to brighten up, uh, until you push that to its max that you're gonna get. So we're gonna add some Kids Lead Flash now, start brightening this up. Take the majority of that paint off the brush until you have it just where you want it on the brush. And then go over those areas you want brightened up. And once you boost that all the way, you can go straight to that lighter color, that Kids Lead Flash. Thin it out and then put it in those spots in a thinner area than you've been doing before. Now with uh, Jason's Hunter, we're going to boost it even further by adding a, a white color or an off-white tan. Brightest spots on the fingers, make sure to highlight with this bright color as well. The knuckles and any of those really kind of higher tendons you want to hit to make the hand look even more like a hand as opposed to a hunk of plastic. That's important too. 
If you ever notice that your blending isn't blending really smooth, you can wet your brush and just feather the edges to where it kind of just smooths it into the coat below it. Now some of these are gonna look kind of bright right now to you. You might be looking at this thing, man, that looks like it stands out. That's good because we're gonna hit this with a shade, which we're gonna talk about next week with shading, or washes I should say. So there we have it. There's the highlighted version of Jason Todd. And the important thing about this is that it's all those spots we want to hit. We want to hit the nose, make sure the nose pops, the chin pops, the cheekbones pop, the hands, make sure your hands look good. And you say, but that looks a little bright. We're going to talk about it next week with the washes. So that's it. Highlighting is all about making those things that we catch natural sunlight pop and look more realistic. That's what we're after, realism. Thanks for watching. Enjoy your breakfast. What's up everyone? My name is Melissa McCack and this is Smashing Buttons and Slamming Cards. This is a segment where I talk about a video game I love and I connect it to a board game I love. And this week I want to talk about Life is Strange, the video game. Life is Strange is pretty cool. You get to take on the role of some sort of character and live out an instance of their life. And you make choices along the way and those choices impact the outcome of certain things that happen throughout the game. I'd like to connect that to the Graphic Novel Adventures. So the Graphic Novel Adventures are pretty cool. They are sort of like your choose your own adventure books, but in a graphic novel format, which I love. And you're making choices throughout the story and those choices matter. They dictate what happens next, what, how the outcome will change and everything like that. And I think that, that ties in closely with Life is Strange, both games I really like. I love when your choices matter in games. Anyway, that's it for this week. Thank you so much for watching. If you'd like, you could check out mine and my brother's podcast called Room 51. I'll see you next time. Okay, well, right now, you know, there's a lot of, you know, when you go to the news, there's a lot of political stuff, of course. But if you go past the political stuff, you'll notice the coronavirus becoming a big thing, especially in China. Um, this is something that personally uh, has affected me. Uh, my brother-in-law and his wife, his wife is Chinese, they live in China. Um, and they, have, they run a school over there. And they happen to visit us over the Lunar New Year. And they can't go back right now because everything's closed down, Americans can't go back there. Now, I don't know what's gonna happen with the coronavirus in general. Well, none of us do, right? We're hoping it's contained, we hope this, and, and we really feel bad for the people who've lost loved ones to this just terrible thing. Uh, this is also affecting board gaming. Already, on a personal level, we've seen it affect the Dice Tower because we were gonna get samples of a lot of the different things we have for our Kickstarter, and we can't right now because the factories were all shut down. And in fact, you're going to see us slowing down a little bit in the industry as a whole because a lot of things that were being produced right now aren't going to happen because of the coronavirus. Now, I saw this mentioned online and immediately someone came in and said, we shouldn't worry about such things when there's people dying from the virus. Well, I get that, but there's also bad things happening in the world every single day and I can't let those never let me do anything interesting or fun. So yes, we definitely can feel bad and have our prayers and sympathies for those affected by it, but we also can realistically talk about this will affect the board game industry to a whole. How much? Well, we're just going to have to wait and see. Certainly the factories are closed right now. Some of the things aren't even able to be shipped to America. This too shall pass and things will go back to normal with the exception of what's happened to the different people. This is a situation, I, in, in a sense, I don't know how much concern we have on a global level about this. It's something that I don't know a lot about. I read the news, lots of different reports and things about it. And so all I can sit here is talk about how it affects it. It's kind of interesting because we play Pandemic, a game all the time about such things, diseases and all. And it's a little odd, like right now, I don't know that I'd want to play Pandemic, or even worse, you know, the, the game in which you are attacking the world and spreading diseases, you know, that sort of thing, because it feels too real. And that's an interesting uh, concept, because I played that last year and I didn't have a problem with it, but now it's kind of a little, eh. And I don't, I don't think you can't play these type of games, right? Yeah. We play war games, and there's, there's a lot of people who have different tolerance for theming and game, and I don't necessarily want to go off on that particular tangent, but it is something that's going on right now, this coronavirus, and it is affecting a lot of things going on. 
Where will it go in the future? Well, we'll have to wait and see. At the end of the day, I want people to be well and healthy and the getting our games and stuff, we, that's, I don't want to even say it's a secondary concern, it's a tertiary concern at best, but it does affect that and it's something we need to realize and so also when things are delayed as they invariably will be, because whenever there's a delay, things back up and there's more and more delays, we also have to be understanding about what's going on. So not a super positive Tom thinks this week, but it is, you know, it's what I've been thinking about. Card drafting is a really popular mechanism popularized by games like Sushi Go and Seven Wonders. In a drafting game, players are selecting things from a common pool, okay? In a traditional card drafting game that a lot of people think about is what I like to call a pick and pass game. So you might have a hand of cards, you're going to pick one of the cards from your hand, keep it, and pass the rest of the player to one of your sides. And then you receive a new hand of cards that you're going to take one and pass the rest. Now that doesn't have to be cards, a uh, popular game from last year, Draftosaurus, you pass a uh, little wooden dinosaurs instead of cards. And so ultimately you're taking a hand of cards that is not your own, keeping something, passing it, and then you get a new one. Another way that you can do drafting games is not in uh, private hands of cards, but out on the table. So a, game, a very popular game that does this is Ticket to Ride. That's not often seen as a drafting game, but the market of cards, of train cards that are at the top, is a drafting type mechanism because you are pulling those cards from a common pool. Another game uh, that does this interestingly is Cat Lady. So instead of drawing one card on your turn, you're drawing a set of cards on your turn from a common pool. Also dice games do this a lot. Uh, this is a roll and write game, Dizzle. You roll all the dice and then you have a common pool that everybody is selecting dice from on their turns. So ultimately, a drafting game, you are selecting items from a common pool, and then it goes to the next player's turn. That might be a kind of a, a common hand that you're passing around, or could just be from the table. That's it. How much? I'm not paying them prices. Hello, my name's Dan, and I like board games. But as well as board games, I like saving money because I'm very tight. I don't like spending money at all. So I thought I'd do a segment about both those things. I'm going to take an expensive game and see if there are any alternatives that give you the same kind of feel, um, but for less money. The first game I'm going to talk about is this game, Blood in the Clock Tower. This is a social deduction game where you've got to find a hidden traitor by talking to each other and accusing people and all that kind of stuff. It costs $95. $95. Are there any other cheaper alternatives? There, there certainly are. I mean, the first one that springs to my mind is this. Uh, Resistance Avalon. Um, social deduction game. Different roles. Trying to work out who the traitor is. Doesn't pay quite as many people as Blood in the Clock Tower. That plays 20. This plays, I think, about 7 or 8. But still, similar feel. And it's 80. I had to do the math then. $80 cheaper. Than Blood in the Clock Tower. Is it worth $80 more? I don't know. You tell me. There's even cheaper though. There's even cheaper. There's this one. A pack of cards. What can you do with a pack of cards? Well, you can play Mafia with a pack of cards. You can play Werewolf. You can you can use those cards to give out roles and things like that and have a very similar experience. You've got social deduction, you've got different roles, you're trying to find the traitor, all that kind of stuff. There's a moderator in this one as well, just like Blood in the Clock Tower. But $5. Can you go even cheaper? Yes, you can. Zero dollars this cost me. I found this in my garden. It's a rock. Now, with this rock, you can play a hidden traitor game where, where people have to work out who's done done things, who's the traitor and things like that. And I'll, sh I'll show you how. Hang on, ready? Hey, who threw that? Uh, um, I'm not sure. I, I, I think it might have been Cora. <laughs> Zero dollars. 
And that's it for another Board Game Breakfast. Thanks so much for joining me. Thanks to all my fantastic contributors for doing it. Later on this week, we're going to be playing another live play of Lander. So come and check that out this Friday. So that's going to be exciting. Guys, we hope that you come and have a great time with us over the course of the week. As you can see from last week, the reviews are back. Weekend review went up again today. So there's more reviews coming. I'm going to be jumping into that in just a bit. Lots of exciting times ahead. Thank you for joining us. Until next time, I'm Tom Vassell. You've been watching The Dice Tower Board Game Breakfast. Thanks for watching Board Game Breakfast. Tune in each week for your daily dose of gaming goodness with Tom Vassell and all the gang. Until next time, I'm Eric Summerer, and you've been watching Board Game Breakfast, a Dice Tower production.